we will be um, not doing the introductions that we did the last time verbally, but ask you to introduce yourselves through the chat. So there are two specific areas for uh, text interactions. I'll be watching both. There is a chat section, which Linda has typed into and Taylor and so forth. I can see those. Um, and I would ask you to introduce yourselves if you've got links to things that you'd like people to know about. That's a great place. We'll try and look at that. From a Q&A standpoint, that is a separate window. You'll see a Q&A section on the uh, bottom of the controls. And I will be watching that. We will take questions at the end of this not uh, at the end of each of the presentations. So please um, type in your questions and we'll either answer them verbally or try and get the panelists to answer them um, uh, through typing if we don't have time. Um, from a uh, organizational standpoint, what I am gonna do is unmute everybody. I have to go through and manually do this. Right now, nobody can talk. I'm gonna mute you, but I would ask you specifically to make sure that your microphone is muted. I can see um, through the application who is making noise if you are. So if you're crunching chips as we had last week, I'm just gonna say we can hear you. So you need to mute yourself. The reason I'm unmuting you is that it helps for the conversation rather than me having to find the name in the list. So I'm, I'm in, uh, imploring you to be um, as helpful as you can so that we can make this as interactive as possible and I will do the best that I can uh, through this uh, process. I will hold up signs. Um, we are recording this um, and we will post a, um, a completed video that I'll try and edit down. I've learned a little bit more over the last uh, month of how to do that and some of the um, uh, means in which we can make the video a little bit more interesting. Um, if you have questions or concerns or anything that you'd like to um, uh, say please uh, direct them to the chat. By the way, the chat can go to everybody, to an individual, um, but from a privacy and security standpoint, Zoom records everything and it all gets dumped out into the files at the end. So if you have a personal chat that is between you and somebody else, it does actually appear in the final records. Just be aware of that. So you should make sure that anything you put in there you don't mind essentially being public. Not that I'm gonna make any of this public, but I think people should be aware of these things that are not always obvious. Um, I've achieved my um, introduction in uh, five minutes, which means that uh, we can get to David um, ahead of time, which means if we lose time, then I know it's not my fault anymore. David, over to you. Well, Nick, thanks very much. And welcome everybody to the April meeting of Health Tech Net. Um, Obviously, for many years, some 20 years, actually, we've been meeting personally and um, enjoying lunch together and going around the room and uh, networking and interacting. And this really, uh, starting with last month, seemed like a, a difficult new format, and we wondered how well it would work. I will say that um, I had the pleasure, maybe some of the rest of you did too, of watching last Tuesday night a Zoom call of the uh, virtually all of the Washington Nationals World Series team um, on Facebook, and they were they were all watching um, a replay on Masson of Game Seven of the World Series. Um, it was one of the most enjoyable and one of the funniest um, experiences I've had in a long time, and that was sort of the feedback from people. Uh, and it, it it clarified that Zoom can be a lot of fun. Um, of course, it helped in their case that most of them had some adult beverages of various kinds, which they were uh, uh, showing off and spilling down. And uh, Brian Dozier came on the call with no shirt on. Um, and uh, there, were, there were a lot of uh, fun things about it. If you want to watch that, uh, you can go to facebook.com uh, nationals and look for the video uh, Mark 2019 World Series game. But uh, uh, it, it, it showed how much fun you can have on Zoom. Um, I also have been watching the experience of my grandchildren who are in public school in New York City, uh, setting up their own Zoom calls just to talk to their friends about baseball cards and that sort of thing. So I guess we're a little bit behind in, um, in uh, learning the technology, or we need some nine-year-old kids to help us out. But Nick, uh, I think you've accomplished that. 
for uh, can, can, can I ask a question real quick? Is Richard, can you guys hear me? Okay, well, to continue, uh, we're going to introduce some efficiencies that we learned about in our last call. Nick has gone through those, so hopefully this will go a little more at pace. I also want to alert you that the uh, uh, recording of, of uh, this call, and the recording of our last call back in March, is posted on our website, healthtechnet.net. So if you want to watch that, if you weren't able to, you can, you can do it there. I especially want to thank uh, Jim Oakes and the other members of the program committee for pulling this presentation together. Um, we'll have another one in May. I have a feeling it will also be virtual based upon what we're hearing. Uh, that will be May 15th. Um, and uh, the topics will be several fold. First of all, obviously with what's going on, we're going to focus on the virus, the effects of the virus and the uses of technology to deal with the virus in every meeting for the foreseeable future. Um, we still will have some of the uh, basic topics that we've outlined and that we continue to follow, such as electronic medical records. Um, and um, uh, in, in the case of the May meeting, we'll focus to some degree on health information exchanges and um, how they are useful. We're hoping to get a, a speaker from Maryland uh, for that topic. Um, we're also hoping to get a speaker from MITRE, uh, which is involved in um, uh, doing research uh, on the coronavirus and gathering information. Um, and I've noticed uh, just in watching the news that uh, it's a big topic of conversation as to how all this information on patients and their circumstances can be gathered and collected. And the fact that, um, that there is a real dearth of, of personnel uh, available in this country to gather that information and to assemble it and to uh, use it. So that's going to be an important topic. Um, we're also uh, hoping that uh, Erkan Hassan, one of our uh, longtime members, can talk to us about telemedicine uh, and the rollout of telemedicine, which obviously is an important topic. So we have a lot to, uh, going on as we look down the road. Um, today will be a very interesting meeting. And uh, with that, uh, Jim, I will turn it over to, uh, to you, to Jim Oaks, to introduce the speakers. We appreciate you all participating. And we look forward to uh, all of your comments later in the meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to uh, quickly show you two uh, websites or, or two things that uh, I think are kind of interesting that if you're interested, we don't have, we can't, uh, distribute articles at the start of the meeting, so I'm just going to show you websites instead. And let me see if I can, if I'm smart enough to share my screen. And we'll figure that out in just a second. Yes, I am smart enough to do that. I hope you can all see this. You remember seeing the uh, Johns Hopkins website last month that Joe Bormel showed us. And the Hopkins website does a really good job of showing day by day what's going on around the world. This website takes graphical information from Hopkins and graphs it out in a variety of ways. This particular one shows cases by country. And if you notice down at the bottom, you can change the, the graph from a log graph to a linear graph. You can focus on particular countries. I was on a website with some of our partners in Kenya this morning and we were looking at their experience, but you can highlight any particular country like I've just done with changing it to the United States. You can then look at cases by state and by territory. And what's been interesting as well is that you can normalize the look by population. So that whereas the US shows the largest number of cases in the world right now, when you look at it, it's a percent of the population, it's a bit different. So that's interesting. And you can do the same thing for states. So that's that's an interesting way to look at look at some of this. The other thing that I wanted to share briefly is a, a, a tool that Dr. Farouk Alimi has developed with a couple of his colleagues. He's just published a paper on a, a big data analysis of coronavirus. And it's, it's, I think you all know he's a professor at George Mason University, specializing in big data and health applications. And what he's done here is just develop a self-assessment tool that lets somebody assess their own symptoms against the typical systems or symptoms of coronavirus. 
and lets them just answer the question of should I go in to see a doctor. So uh, I'm not making any medical judgments, of course, as to whether that's uh, valid or not, but I thought it was an interesting tool and we'll be happy to make both those links available to you all if you'd like them. So let me now move into introducing our three speakers and I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce all three of them and turn it over to them. Uh, the first speaker will be Marty Rosendale, who's the CEO of the Maryland Tech Council. He's uh, also a partner with Newport LLC and a partner at WMCS Investments. Uh, Marty's been a five-time CEO and a two-time company founder. His experience spans public, private, and non-for-profit businesses, and he has launched, branded, acquired, or commercialized more than 10 products and companies. So Marty's got a lot of really interesting background, and he's going to talk with us about what is going on in the state of Maryland with uh, response to coronavirus. He's going to touch on a number of things. Some One of the tools that he'll be showing I think is really interesting is a tool they've developed to help small companies look at what uh, opportunities may be available for them. Uh, next speaker then is going to be Dr. Brenda Dentiman. Uh, Dr. Dentiman's a longtime friend and uh, colleague of mine. Uh, she's also been my dermatologist for the past 20 years and is responsible for my youthful good looks. But uh, she is a board certified dermatologist. She's been in practice for about 30 years and she's been an early adopter of electronic health records. She's been a early advocate of telemedicine. She's the former president of the Medical Society of Northern Virginia. She's a member of the American Telemedicine Association. Uh, she's testified before Congress on the promise of telehealth and she founded about six or eight years ago a small company called Dermatopia which includes a telemedicine app. So she's got a lot of hands-on experience with telemedicine and is going to talk a bit about some of the opportunities and some of the on-the-ground challenges that she sees physicians facing in, in rolling this out. And then our final speaker will be Trish Marcus, who is a partner with Nelson Mullins in the North Raleigh, North Carolina office. Uh, Trish specializes in providing strategic and practical legal advice to healthcare providers and related companies on a broad array of regulatory compliance and transactional matters, has a special focus on HIPAA and other data, data privacy and security laws, cybersecurity and uh, telehealth and, and other technology transfers. Uh, Trish is a Boston Law School graduate, serves on the board of directors of the American Health Law Association, and is a past chair of that group's health information and technology practice group. So I think we're gonna have some, some really interesting presentations. I'm really looking forward to hearing it. And with that, let me turn it over to Marty, uh, who will be the first speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, I appreciate the introduction and uh, everybody. It's been, it's been a while since I've been to a health tech, neck, tech, health tech net meeting. Um, and it's great to be back. It's good. It's good to see you. It's good to uh, to hear from you. And uh, I appreciate your your interest. So the the Maryland Technology Council is the industry trade association in Maryland that represents all of the technology and life science companies throughout the state. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we have 455 members today. Uh, we're very active in advocacy, so legislative efforts in, um, in, in connecting our members with each other and, and, and with others such as investors and strategic partners and educational initiatives. But fundamentally, our role is to help our members succeed. <clears throat> so when this all began, um, if you recall, it was right in the middle of the uh, general session in Annapolis. So a lot of us were spending most of our days in Annapolis in, in the House and Senate buildings or uh, dealing with legislative issues. <clears throat> we were watching the reports coming out of China and other parts of the world and just beginning to wonder what the impact was going to be on us. And as you think back, um, th as things began to lock down, we saw that the general session, they, they adjourned early on, on March 18th, uh, the, gover the governor began to issue his executive orders <clears throat> that got us uh, to where we are today. So as the process began, um, the first thing, first things that we got involved with 
were the, the obvious and, and, sh and concerned shortages. So personal protective equipment, testing, the, uh, the testing collection kits, uh, commonly referred to as swabs, the, th the things that, that were clearly in short supply <clears throat> and, and we were gonna need um, some sort of solution for. Now, you, you're all keeping up with the news, so you know that we haven't resolved those issues entirely. Um, we're still seeing that our healthcare providers are not fully protected. Uh, personal protective equipment is still an issue. Testing uh, is still an issue, but on the testing side, it's been getting, been getting a lot better. The, some of those shortages have, have um, uh, become less and less severe. So, so we're seeing improvement in these things as, as we go along. <clears throat> but one of the first sources of confusion was in the definition of essential businesses when the governor first began to issue his restrictions on, on going out in public and, and basically uh, uh, isolating in place and, and whatnot. So when that all process began, ourselves, the Tech Council, um, other associations be began working with the governor to help make sure that the language that was included in those executive orders was inclusive enough to allow, for instance, biotechnology research and development to continue, to make sure that the facilities that had, that had animals, that, that, that they had, their essential employees could get in and take care of those animals. So to make sure that the, the definitions of essential employees were broad enough to, to cover those needs, because we needed not only to support the response to COVID-19, but in the biopharma industry, you've also got to make sure that the supply chain for everything else, the, the insulin and, and all the other products continue to be supplied and that, and that critical processes like clinical trials and such don't get interrupted needlessly. Now, that said, one of the, the challenges that we faced is, is with clinical trials as the, as the process, as the, the pandemic began to spread and we, we saw more and more the seriousness of the situation patients in clinical trials began not coming to the clinic. So clinical trials got into trouble. And, and we saw a number of issues um, evolve around that. But early on, we focused on, on helping find more protective pers personal protective equipment on testing. We had, uh, as you know, we've got the large labs, LabCorp, Quest, uh, you know, they're doing everything that they can to ramp up their testing. But we've also got companies here like Aperiomics in Northern Virginia and uh, Tetracor in Maryland. Uh, Generation is another company that's working on uh, RNA PCR testing, so so we were able to to work with them to help them ramp up. Today, I believe Aperiomics is doing about 2,500 tests a week, which is, you know, a significant value in in this current situation. So in all of this, <clears throat> we began to see that so many people were coming out and and wanted to help and could help. So I think when we get to the end of this, one of the things that we're going to find is that the, the number of heroes that have stepped forward throughout this process is, is going to be immense. Um, not only in the, the healthcare provider world that we're seeing you know, day in and day out, but <clears throat> in the technology and the life sciences front, we're, we're also, also we're seeing companies that, that knew they could help, that wanted to help, weren't quite sure exactly what to do. Some knew exactly what to do. Novavax knew they could develop a vaccine. Emergent Biosolutions knew they could develop a vaccine. Altamune knew the same. So they jumped right on it. Other companies weren't quite sure how they could pivot and, and what they could do to help in the situation. So we formed what we've begun calling the COVID-19 Coalition. And we just, we got on the phone with our members. We got on the phone with anybody that we thought might have uh, something to offer in the process. And we pulled them all together for a Zoom conference call, much like the, the call that we're on right now. And, and the purpose of that call was to introduce the companies to each other to make sure that they all knew who the players were in, in, the, in the process, give everybody a chance to talk about what they were doing, what they might be able to do, and what they needed, because we also wanted to understand you know, where, what were the shortages, what were the, the supplies and services that were, that were needed. On that first call, we had 34 representatives from 20 different companies throughout the region. Uh, today in that coalition, we've got 34 companies that are all actively doing something in the, in the, the, the solution, the, the battle against COVID-19. So we've got diagnostics companies, we've got vaccine companies, we've got therapeutics companies like CellSci and Sequela that, that are working on therapeutics. On the vaccine front, 
Um, there, as I mentioned, Novavax, Emergent, Altimmune, Scenaria, uh, they're, they're all working on vaccines as, as fast as they can to, to d develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, some are moving into, the, into clinical trials quickly. Um, because the FDA is being flexible, uh, we expect that the, the normal three to five year process can be reduced to hopefully 12 to 18 months. I think you, you've all, all heard Dr. Fauci talk about the, the possibility of getting these vaccines to market that quickly. So, so they're working quickly on those vaccines. On the diagnostic front, the, the amount of collaboration here has been amazing. All of the, all of the commercial barriers have fallen. And everybody is, is collaborating, everybody is talking, everybody is making sure that when they can share, they, they share. So I'll, I'll give some examples. Um, Kyogen, who is a, a large diagnostic company in, in Germantown, the, their headquarters in Germany, they manufacture two of the collection kits, the commonly referred to as swabs, that are approved by the CDC. So they immediately began ramping up their production. They, they reached out, they looked for temporary employees. Uh, we, we helped them identify sources of labor. <clears throat> and they began ramping up that process, but they, they realized quickly that they had a transportation issue. Well, another one of our members, Lockheed Martin, had offered access to their fleet of jets. So we were able to connect Kyogen with Lockheed and, and facilitate that, that transportation issue. Emergent Biosolutions had a similar problem. They, they needed some assistance with, with transportation. We were also able to connect them with Lockheed. Um, we've been able to connect companies with the United States Pharmacopeia to, to help with the standards for these diagnostics and, and the vaccines, as well as the, the American Type Culture Collection, who, who also was providing supplies and support. All in all, we've been able to make about 18 connections between companies and others. Um, another one that, that's kind of interesting that, that came out of this. Um, in a minute, I'm going to show you our, our website, but on that website, there's a, a form that you can fill out. It's a brief form. It, it asks you who you are, what you do, what do you need, and what can you offer? <clears throat> and one of the responses to that form came from the Naval Warfare, Surface Warfare uh, Center in Carter Rock. And what they said was, hey, we've got 100 3D printers that nobody's currently using, and we've got manufacturing space, and we don't know what to do with it. So we were able to put them in touch with OpenWorks out of Baltimore, who had initiated a collaboration of, of companies with 3D printers that were printing face shields for healthcare providers. And through that collaboration, <clears throat> the Naval Surface Warfare Center was able to get involved, put those 100 3D printers to work, and begin printing the, the face shields that our, our healthcare providers so desperately need right now in, in, in this battle against the virus. So, so these connections have been uh, amazing from the sense that everybody wants to collaborate, everybody wants to be a part of the solution, everybody is stepping up to, to help. <clears throat> Again, coming back to the, the diagnostic front, one of the big healthcare companies in Maryland is Becton Dickinson, BD out of Sparks. And uh, they have a product called the BD Max. The BD Max is an automated PCR testing device. It can do approximately 700, 750 COVID-19 RNA PCR tests per day. And so they began ramping up the production of the BD Max devices because they knew there was going to be a tremendous demand for them. Um, we we got on the phone with with uh, the head of their IDS group and, and began talking through how many of those devices are currently based in Maryland. Where are they? How do we, how do we put them to work? How can we maximize their, their utilization? And how can we get more devices? Because what made a lot of sense, it, I think we, we discovered that we had 12 locations across Maryland that already had BD Max devices. So the question was, the smartest thing to do would be if we can get more BD Max devices instead of putting them in places where we'd have to train, train staff, let's put them alongside the devices that already exist and, and increase the amount of throughput that we can facilitate in the state. So, so we, get, we began working with them on those kinds of efforts. And then at the same time, Becton Dickinson, seeing the shortage of collection kits and swabs, found a source uh, overseas and began importing collection kits to, to help offset that shortage. And they, they found a source for serological tests out of China. So they were able to get an FDA emergency use authorization. The, they're one of the two current serological tests that have an, an EUA from, from the FDA. 
and began importing those serological tests. And <clears throat> the reason that's important is because there's a, there's a chance, there's a, a hope anyway, that the patients that have contracted the virus and recovered or contracted the virus and never had any symptoms in the first place have developed immunity. The serological test will identify those antibodies. We don't know for sure the extent of that immunity today, but it'll be an indication that these are people that can go back to work, that can, get, that can leave the, the isolation and move forward. So having those serological tests in the next wave of testing is, is going to be very important. So now Beckton Dickinson is importing those tests. I believe Abbott <clears throat> is also importing those tests. Right here in Maryland, 2020 Gene Systems found another source in China for those tests and, and is, is importing those tests um, as we speak and also applying for their EUA um, authorization from the FDA. So we've got those serological tests now coming into the state. <clears throat> On top of that, I don't know if you saw the news this morning, but AstraZeneca just donated 3 million um, uh, face masks. Uh, about a million of those are going to be coming to Maryland. So we're just, we're seeing collaboration and resources um, coming in from all over. And we're, we're working with the Department of Commerce, the Department of Health, our companies here to facilitate this collaboration and, and to help facilitate uh, bringing these, these materials in. I'm trying to make sure I don't, I don't miss any of the players here because there, there are just so many people that have stepped up. You know, another big one is Noxalizer, which is a, a company developing sterilization technology in Baltimore. They, they utilize nitrogen dioxide to, to pr produce a, a cold sterilization process, which is ideally suited for re-sterilizing personal protective equipment. So we were able to get them on the phone and talk with them about um, what they were doing and, and hopefully get them connected with some funding to support the validation that they can in fact re-sterilize, use PPE so that we can put it back in use for our healthcare providers and, and help, um, help offset this challenge. <clears throat> so, so all in all, um, there's just been a tremendous amount of, of collaboration and, and support from the community from Northern Virginia, from DC, from the entire Mid-Atlantic. And everybody that I've talked to um, wants to help, wants to step up, wants to be a part of it. Um, the, the coalition now includes Children's National Medical Center because they can offer assistance on the clinical front. It includes clinical research organizations because they can help with the, the testing and trials of the vaccines and the therapeutics. So <clears throat> that, that group continues to expand. They continue to work together. And, and like I said, the, the, the um, the commercialization barriers, the competition barriers have all fallen. On the, on the business continuity front, that's been another challenge. So we've heard a lot about the stimulus funds and the, 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 the programs that have come out from the state and from the federal government uh, that are intended to help companies with their, their, their business continuity going forward. One of the, the things that, that we're seeing <clears throat> is <clears throat> Some of our companies um, got into trouble right at the outset. Maybe they were companies that needed capital and were just about to do a capital raise and all of a sudden the capital markets dried up because of the pandemic. Or maybe you know, they, they were living hand to mouth <clears throat> from their sales revenues and their, and their pipeline dried up. So we had some emergent situations. We need to jump in and work with our companies to help them with their business resilience and, and do, help them do whatever they needed to do in order to survive the early days of this pandemic. But we've also got companies now that are looking forward. They're, they're doing okay right now. They've got cash right now. They're, they're, they're resilient, but they see their pipeline drying up. <clears throat> they see their, their salespeople can't get in to visit physicians. And, and, and so, um, we've been able to mobilize our, our venture mentoring service, which is a group of volunteer um, business professionals that um, come together and mentor companies. And many of them have been through previous black swan type events, so whether it's the 2008 Great Recession or the, uh, the dot-com bubble. Um, they've been through these kinds of events. They've seen what happens on the other side. They've led companies or guided companies through these events. So we've been able to mobilize them to, to help guide some of these companies through these challenges. <clears throat> In addition to that, um, we've had all the stimulus packages that, that have come up. So what I, what I just opened up on the screen is the, the Tech Council's website. Now, everybody has a COVID-19 resource hub today. So there's nothing particularly unique about the Tech Council's resource hub. 
um, except we do have this form that I mentioned where companies can come in here, tell us what you need, tell us what you have to offer, and we will make connections for you. Uh, we, we, will, we will put it to work and we'll do our best to get you um, the, the services and the supplies that you need to help fight the battle against COVID-19. Um, the other thing that we started, we, I, I've been doing a, a Capital M podcast, which is focused on access to capital markets. We've converted that to a live video Zoomcast. And, and we've been focusing on business continuity uh, with that podcast, again, to help companies weather this storm. But what I really wanted to show you was this. This is the Maryland Business Relief Wizard. <clears throat> In one of our board meetings, one of our board members on the tech side of our organization said, what can the tech community do to help this battle? And we got to talking about it and realized that one of the challenges is all the complexity around the stimulus and the support for businesses out there. And so the, the, the tech community within the tech council put their heads together and say, well, why can't we develop an application that acts as a wizard to walk companies through the process? It took them only about 10 days. They came together, the collaboration included the Maryland Tech Council, it included um, MindGrub, it included, included BTS Software Solutions, it included Howard County Economic Development, Howard County Chamber, the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, and, uh, and the Maryland Department of Commerce, all in collaboration, came together, analyzed all the different packages, and put them into this, this wizard. Now you can see some of these are X'd out, because as you know, these programs, um, are out of funds and, and, and no longer taking applications. The Maryland programs, um, within just a couple of days, there was 40,000 applications and they had to stop taking applications. Um, but we expect some of these will be refunded. The way the wizard works, it's very easy. You, you simply agree to the terms. You answer about 20 questions. You get through these questions and it tells you specifically which, which packages you're eligible for, and it gives you a link uh, to where you go to, to apply. So it's pretty straightforward. It was a, an amazing collaboration between tech companies and, and the government to put this together. Um, as of yesterday, we had about 9,000 unique visits to this site. 2,600 um, people have actually used it and, 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 and checked their eligibility for access to these stimulus packages. Um, so it's been a, a tremendous benefit, a tremendous value. And again, this was a, a collaborative, eff collaborative effort from a, a number of organizations that came together and very quickly responded to a, a problem and, and a challenge that we were facing. Um, the, the, the one thing I, I know our next speakers are gonna be talking about telemedicine. So one additional thing that I, that I wanted to bring up, um, one of our members is Ironbow. I had a chance to talk with Iron Bow yesterday. I wanted to get a sense as to what, what they've been doing and, and what what's been happening in the field of telemedicine in this region recently. So Iron Bow is the number one telemedicine provider for the Veterans Administration. They're also one of the top telemedicine providers um, commercially throughout the country. Because of the pandemic and the demand for telemedicine, their telemedicine product sales, their, the hardware sales has gone up 3X, so three times what it was last year. The Veterans Administration placed an order for thousands of their, of their personal home devices, the, the devices that the, the patients use at home to communicate with their physician. And um, what they were telling me is that the, because the federal government relieved the, the regulation that prevented doctors from, from working across state boundaries, um, this is what really expanded the telemedicine process, or at least uh, for them. And it was done um, for very good reason. It, it allows doctors from outside the states to, to jump in and help the states that are overwhelmed by the pandemic right now. But I, what I thought was most interesting about uh, the, the learnings here from Ironbow is that it has changed entirely how they look at the market. They told me that before this began, they saw the market simply as a device market. We manufacture devices, we ship them out, and people communicate on them. What they realize now is there's a tremendous opportunity for, for data analytics and, and to, to monitor where and how telehealth is being used, and then to use that information to optimize the value of the, the technology and telehealth going forward. So I thought that was a, a, a very interesting conclusion on their part. 
Um, so I'm going to stop there. I guess uh, we'll be taking questions at the at the end. I Okay. Thank you, Marty. I think um, uh, Jim is, uh, or uh, Jim, I know you were going to do intros, but your video is off. Uh, are you ready to? Yeah. Go yeah well, let me let me just turn this over to Dr. Dentiman then, if uh, if she's ready, uh, I'll get her to unmute herself and uh, go ahead and turn it over to her. Still muted. Let's see if I can help her out. Unmute. I need, I didn't there. need. Unmute. There we go. Okay. You're set. Yeah, I was going to say this is going to be a nice crossover between all the speakers because I think there's going to be some themes. And um, just to reiterate some of the things he told you about me, uh, not only am I a dermatologist of over 30 years, I started out my career in internal medicine and emergency medicine. So I have a passion for the house of medicine, and th hence that's how I became the, the president of the Medical Society of Northern Virginia to look at issues that affected patients and uh, doctors in this area. The interesting thing about this is that many of us, I think, in technology started with telemedicine maybe a little too early. It's, it's been around more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. When uh, the app was created, Dermutopia, in 2012, we were super excited. Uh, the co-founder of this, Christine Shanahan, Dr. Christine Shanahan of Northwestern University, interfaced with Nelson Mullins to make the best legal possibility and HIPAA compliant product. She interfaced with people from MIT and Carnegie Mellon. She was the true interfacer with this, whereas I was the physician creating the questionnaires. She happens to be my daughter. She is now a resident in internal medicine in the COVID unit ICU today again. So the, both of these topics are super dear to my heart, the concept of how we're helping doctors and patients interface with technology. So as you can imagine, we were struggling along for more than six, eight years trying to get this used by physicians across the country, and we had roadblocks. Well, from one day to the next, when COVID became an issue, I had over 25 phone calls, emails, texts, asking to use the technology. Harvard was talking to me, texting me throughout the day. And then what happened? I think it was noon, we heard from the federal government that anything goes, that we could have, hold on one second, so I don't have to look at my whole time. So that we could have any, any device would work. FaceTime, Doxy, you name it. So all of a sudden, from one minute, you're going to be a hero. You finally arrived. Telemedicine arrived. But we were not ready. And why weren't we ready? Because in spite of the fact that with CMS and Medicare, they said cross state lines would be fine. We would be covered. We didn't have to worry about whether patients were existing patients anymore. All devices worked, whether they were HIPAA compliant or not. As they always say, the devil's in the details. This was okay for the federal government, but it's not okay for states. So this has been the main thing that had been holding us back all along. Every time we had somebody that wanted to come on board, we had to find out where they were licensed, where their malpractice covered, whether they had their own malpractice. So here we are back to the same situation. That so licensure, malpractice, and reimbursement. Immediately, we were told that all reimbursement would be equivalent to an in-person visit. And that wasn't true. So let's talk about the positives. The positives are that we know that with licensure, we already have some interstate licensure coalitions going on. And I could show a picture of that. I'll, show, I'll send that to you, that some states are enabling us to have a license in one state that helps with coverage in you know, 15, 20 states. That's not true in Virginia. I, I don't think that's true in Maryland. Um, but those are some initial improvements that have been made. The problem is that even if we're told we're allowed to see a patient across the state lines, your malpractice doesn't cover you. 
So I got on the phone with malpractice, asked them, look, I'm already licensed in New Mexico, Maryland, Virginia, Hawaii. I have this random beginning of licensure. Um, you know, will you cover me? Mm, you're only covered in these two states. So that's been a huge hindrance. And a lot of those things were sort of misrepresented, you know, and it's unfortunate because patients got the impression that they would be covered by all comers, didn't matter where they resided, didn't matter what insurance they had. So I think that Medicare initially uh, had, had their rules with where you had to be, your location of service, and what the coding, and they were gonna have the, the coding be reimbursement be equivalent to in-person. In Virginia, we had equivalency law since 2010, but it's very, it's not been tested. And it tended to be that you had to be in a rural area, you had to be, had to be uh, live interactive video conferencing. Definitely, there was very little coverage for phone calls, storm forward, any of the other devices. Um, so again, it, it made, gave the impression that all that had gone out the window. Pretty quickly, doctors started getting rejected claims. They started getting um, reimbursement that was not equivalent uh, to an in-person visit. So when I first started talking to Jim, I was pretty disappointed, but I cannot believe what progress we've made in two weeks. And, as, and from the um, conference I was on two days ago, they said, you know, we're seeing changes, not yearly, daily in the States. So any documentation that you have, any website, almost needs to be checked daily to see what's going on with which states are having waivers during this COVID crisis. I don't know what's gonna happen later. My theory is HIPAA will be all back. I don't see why with all the wonderful HIPAA compliant companies there are devices that we wouldn't be using HIPAA, except there are definitely still patients that don't have technology. They don't have a cell phone, they don't have a computer, and I think allowances should be made for those. Licensure, I think, needs to stop being a hindrance to the, to the um, growth of telemedicine. If we can find a way to have coalitions, whether it's the East Coast, the Southeast, et cetera, so we can provide across state lines, I think that would be a wonderful growth for telemedicine. Malpractice has to follow. They, have to, they, they will have to follow along and make it easier. Right now, you almost have to apply for a new malpractice policy and more expensive policy just to treat one patient that might be across state lines. All of these things are an unnecessary use of our resources. Right now, our resources should be used to help patients, to treat them quickly, and to keep them out of the ER. Our goal should be to keep them out of the ER it kind of touched on our heart because uh, dermatology has been, uh, and some of the especially has been focused on this concept of essential, non-essential. And that you know, can be a big ethical issue. But I think any patient that's kept from going to the ER is helping the COVID crisis right now. The last and the most difficult part is reimbursement. Medicare has come into line in that they are allowing the point of service to be the same as your office in the coding. So there will be no decrease in your reimbursement. They're making it more simplistic. They're increasing the amount of uh, coverage for phone calls, which is helping, again, patients that do not have technology. The problem is in the private payers. The private payers are all over the place. They're literally still telling us, pick up the phone and call and check whether your patient is covered or not. We don't have the resources to do that. We don't have the emotional, the physical support to do this. It's not the right thing. So in Virginia, I heard that the Medical Society of Virginia was going to speak directly to the heads of some of these companies and ask them to come in line with Medicare in this time of crisis. And my hopes would be down the line that there would be a more uniform, consistent reimbursement. In the past, I think telemedicine has survived almost as a passion of love. We used to do free consults for project access, for the free clinics. It was a great, you know, passionate thing that we did to, to help others, but it cannot sustain without reimbursement. There were times when the reimbursement was $10 for a 45 minute telemedicine call. 
So I think that I'm seeing that there's going to be progress made. We're going to collect data. We're going to see that the need is great. And then I think we're going to look back and see what are the patients that were best served for this? What are the patients that really we got better compliance? We got better connection with because they weren't no-shows for their visit. They didn't get frustrated and leave because maybe someone was running behind. What are the patients that we can serve better? Maybe in person one time, telemedicine the next. So I'm gonna be super hopeful that I think we're gonna work a lot of these things out. There's an amazing group of smart technology people, physicians, legal, but we need to have the impetus to go forward and not let us focus on things like there's too much fraud there's too much reimbursement. It's gonna be used inappropriately. I think we've seen that telemedicine has arrived and we need to keep going forward with it. Thank you. Right, thanks. Thank you very much. Sorry, Jim, were you about to jump in? I, I, I was just about to thank her and, uh, and turn it over to Trish. And I, I see she has unmuted herself and is ready to talk. Again, I ask you to Hold wow. your questions to the end, and we will uh, we will deal with them then. Thank you very really, much. Really rocking the technology today, folks. Fantastic. I, it's a you know it's a wonderful thing that everybody wasn't on the pre call where we were trying to figure out how to turn things on. So <laughs> I think they might all... have seen that, Jim. I'm just going to say, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Trish, over to you. Well, thank you, Jim, and and I want to first say thank you to Marty and to Dr. Dentiman for um, really important and interesting uh, updates regarding uh, the COVID situation as well as how um, setting up, how telemedicine right now has really come into focus. And some might say uh, is coming into its own, but as Dr. Dintman noted, there are a number of barriers that still exist. Nonetheless, what I'm gonna speak about, and I'm gonna in a moment share some slides with you all, uh, is what different flexibilities have been provided by the federal and state governments and other agencies to try to address the fact that we're in the middle of um, a pandemic. And what that means is we've got to figure out how to take care of our patients, how to make sure that our healthcare workers uh, are not any more exposed than they have to be, uh, and also that our, our patients and our workforce is not any more exposed than it has to be. So with that, let me see if I can um, upload this presentation. I think that worked. Okay. Um, so I'm going to cover a few things in this in this presentation. One of the things I want to mention before I do is I attended a really interesting presentation put on by the advisory board yesterday. Um, in that presentation, uh, Ford Coles, the executive director, noted that uh, it's estimated that there will be, are you ready for this, 1 billion telehealth visits in the U.S. this year. That's astounding. Uh, in and of itself. But he also noted that compare that to the January 2020 number about the percentage of health organizations that had to play a virtual care program. It was 24%. And so going back to something Dr. Dintman said, were we ready for this to um, you know, roll out telemedicine on a scale that we need to to address the needs of our population during the crisis? And the answer, in my view, is no, certainly not, uh, which may explain some of the flexibilities that we're going to talk about today. Um, CMS issued a number of waivers to address a lot of issues related to the pandemic to try to make sure that Medicare beneficiaries were able to safely get care uh, during the public health emergency. And CMS also provided a um, what's called a Section 1135 waiver, which is technical legal stuff we don't need to talk about right now. But that waiver was specific to telehealth uh, treatment and technologies. 
So I'm going to mention a few things related to Medicare and other waivers, and then I also am going to mention a few things at the end of my time to address the CARES Act interim final rule that was published on March 30th, which among other things added about 80 services to the list of those for which Medicare will make payment. And um, it also outlines how telehealth can be used in a variety of healthcare settings that typically had not been able to make use of um, telehealth, at least for payment by Medicare, including things, um, settings like hospice, home health, and inpatient rehab facilities. So, um, and Dr. Dentiman alluded to a number of these changes. Medicare had very specific and um, has, it, I think, <laughs> because I believe that these changes are, are all temporary until the uh, end of the public health emergency. But Medicare has specific limitations on a variety of aspects about uh, telehealth and what it will pay for. Um, it used to be you had to be, if you're a patient, Medicare patient, you had to be in a clinic or in a hospital or somewhere at some site with a telehealth, with a clinician in order for Medicare to pay for telehealth. Um, you also had to be in a rural area. Medicare patients now are being uh, provided covered telehealth visits when patients are in their homes and also when they're in urban locations, which if you think about Seattle, New York City, New Orleans, Detroit, these are places where we need to have telehealth uh, coverage for folks who are not in rural areas. Medicare also required that a patient being seen via telehealth had to be an established patient. At this time, patients can be new and still have covered Medicare business telehealth. As Dr. Dentman mentioned, payment for telehealth visits is the same for in-person visits, or at least that's what's me what Medicare is saying. I don't know how that's actually playing out in the field. And perhaps most, um, uh, in, in, in some ways, challengingly, but helpful for uh, patients who don't have access. CBS procurement. I'm sorry. Oh. Dear. Don't worry, I'll hunt them down and mute them if I can find them. <laughs> Sorry, I thought someone was, was making a comment. Um, but I, I think another very important change that's been made, at least for the purposes of this um, public health emergency, is that now smartphones are permitted to be used for telehealth visits. Medicare has said that for actual telehealth visits, you have to have interactive video and audio capabilities, but Medicare also pays for virtual chats and um, e-visits, and those can be performed through audio-only calls, text messages, or other types of online interactions. Think uh, portal uh, messages, email, etc. cetera. Um, so because now CMS is permitting physicians to provide telehealth services to new patients, um, it, w it says that it um, it and really Department of Health and Human Services is not going to dot its emergency to ensure that a prior relationship existed. Hopefully that will, um, that will continue and, and turn out to be the case. Uh, in addition, another flexibility that was provided is uh, one that the Office of Inspector General uh, has, in, has agreed to. Dr. Dentman also mentioned uh, the concerns about fraud, which are one of the substantial reasons why telehealth has not been more, um, more available. Uh, for the duration of the public health emergency, though, the OIG is allowing Medicare providers to reduce or waive their co-pays and deductibles, uh, understanding that that could be an impediment to uh, patients receiving care and also, frankly, patients receiving care in a safe place. Also, um, as Dr. Dentman noted, FaceTime and Skype now can be used for telehealth. This is kind of a big deal in that this arose from a HIPAA or really an Office for Civil Rights waiver where the OCR indicated it's not gonna impose penalties um, if providers violate certain HIPAA provisions when they're delivering care by telehealth. 
So essentially, if you are providing these services, you have to be serving patients in good faith, but you can use everyday communication technologies such as FaceTime or Skype. It's important to note though that um, this flexibility on the part of the government will not permit the use of so-called public facing video communication applications like Facebook Live or TikTok. That's because those applications really are not um, secure uh, and in the way that a FaceTime or a Skype is. OCR also has said that um, even though it strongly recommends providers work with HIPAA compliant telehealth vendors and have business associate agreements in place with those vendors, who of course would be business associates, the Office for Civil Rights isn't going to impose penalties uh, if an entity does not have a business associate agreement in place or if there are other non-compliance with HIPAA requirements at, so long as uh, telehealth is provided to patients in good faith during this uh, time of emergency. The DEA has also provided some flexibility uh, for provision of services by telehealth during the emergency. For the first time, DEA registered clinicians now can issue prescriptions for controlled substances to new patients. This is a substantial change. Uh, many of you are likely aware that the Ryan Haidt Act generally to this day continues to prohibit clinicians from prescribing controlled substances to people they have not examined in person, although we've been hearing about waivers uh, and changes to that for some time. Um, also, uh, the DEA and SAMHSA have uh, prepared and uh, allowed for additional flexibility starting as of March 1st. Um, this really pertains to outpatient opioid treatment, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because I don't know if folks here participate in those sorts of, um, in, in, in caring for those types of patients. But suffice it to say that these flexibilities allow opioid treatment programs uh, to prescribe buf buprenorphine, which is Suboxone, um, and that's the prescription that you can uh, offer in an office practice to both new and existing patients by phone without an initial in-person or telehealth examination. That's pretty huge. Um, the, the, the phone, uh, provi the provision of this uh, care by phone comes in where the patient doesn't have a smartphone or another way to get telehealth, uh, to get uh, a, a telehealth visit. But it's important to note that this exemption doesn't apply to new patients who are being treated with methadone, which is uh, the treatment where patients have to come in on a daily basis and receive their dose of methadone. So there is some flexibility here. It is not perfect, but it is intended once again to address the concern about having uh, individuals congregate together uh, and perhaps risk their health or the, the health of those who are treating them in person. So in addition to the federal agencies, we are seeing a lot of state uh, flexibilities added regarding um, telehealth during the public health emergency. As of April 15th, a couple days ago, 44 states had some type of waiver in place addressing telemedicine. About a week ago, when I gave an earlier iteration of this presentation, it was only 31 states. So again, as has been said before, we are seeing daily changes to uh, some of the restrictions on providing care and, and frankly paying for care. I did wanna give a shout out to the Federation of State Medical Boards because it really does have a wonderful um, series of resources on COVID-19 and there's a uh, link here to that website. Some of the flexibilities that states are inputting include permitting uh, out-of-state licensees to practice on an emergency basis in a state, um, also permitting out-of-state licensees to prescribe controlled substances in a state where they're not licensed. Some states are even permitting asynchronous services, and then there are some instances where payment parity has been made a requirement. Um, just some of these, I won't go through all of them, but some of these are states where our healthcare group has a presence. And so 
For example, in Florida and Georgia, I've listed on this slide some flexibilities that those states have announced in different ways, permitting out-of-state providers to offer care by telehealth to patients in Florida under certain circumstances. Maryland, which I know some of you hail from, um, enacted a, a law which authorized the governor to establish um, or waive certain protocols for telehealth. Um, so in Maryland, apparently, the, the state has waived the in-state licensure, licensure requirements for out-of-state licensees. My expectation is that that is a temporary thing, as many of these executive orders are. Um, but interestingly, Maryland also ordered the Department of Health to pay for both synchronous and asynchronous services, meaning store and forward, uh, to patients, whether those patients have come into a clinic or whether the patients are at home, so long as the service is covered by uh, Maryland Medicaid and furnished by a Maryland Medicaid participating provider. So although it's not perfect, it's providing some additional flexibility to make sure that Medicaid patients are offered uh, care where they are during this crisis. Since I'm in North Carolina, I did want to mention um, a couple of things that are going on here because I do think that is interesting. Um, in particular, I want to highlight this third bullet point that North Carolina payers, including Blue Cross, Aetna, all of the North Carolina private plans are covering telehealth services and offering payment parity for those services. None of the private payers are requiring prior authorization, originating site or distant site uh, requirements that they typically uh, uh, make a condition of payment. Another really important thing that happened in North Carolina, which I um, have not seen in a ton of other states, is the governor's um, executive order earlier this month, which essentially protects all healthcare workers in the state, including those who are providing telehealth services to North Carolina residents. From civil liability, except where the persons providing the service are engaging in willful misconduct, gross negligence, or bad faith. Um, so it's really extending uh, the Good Samaritan law to healthcare providers during this time of crisis. Now, South Carolina has a narrower uh, flexibility, which essentially is allowing physicians, PAs, and other providers who are licensed elsewhere and considered to be necessary by the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control to provide um, services in or to South Carolina residents. And the Board of Medical Examiners has specified that this means South Carolina um, will allow these out-of-state practitioners to treat in-state residents either in person or by telehealth, but solely to screen or treat patients for the coronavirus. We've been waiting to see if that flexibility is going to be expanded, but as of yesterday, it had not. So that again is a more limited um, state flexibility. And then just a couple of last states. Virginia um, has an executive order that was issued allowing licensees of other states to practice their discipline in Virginia, but only if the person's working for a hospital, nursing facility, or dialysis facility, and if that, that work is related to public health and disaster response operations. Frankly, I would say that most operations for those facilities right now are uh, for those purposes. Even so, uh, those facilities are required to give the Virginia licensing boards the names and license numbers of these people within a reasonable period of time after the person starts working, whatever reasonable means. But again, some nice flexibility. Out-of-state licensees, however, may only see their existing Virginia patients by telehealth. And then in Washington, D.C., out-of-state licensees can offer health care to patients in only a couple of circumstances, where they are at licensed health care facilities in the district or to their existing patients in order to provide those patients with continuity of care. So I think this leaves a number of open questions uh, that I want to address briefly, and I'm sure these will provide some food for maybe a, a discussion a little, in a little while. Um, informed consent, 
a lot of clients have asked, how am I supposed to get a person who I'm talking with by Skype to uh, provide written informed consent to receive services by telehealth? Or for that matter, if this is a first time patient, what do I do about that? And the practical answer is, well, you're probably not going to get written informed consent from them uh, under those circumstances, but you can do a, a number of things, whether it's following up with something in writing, you can ask the patient, or you can explain um, what it means to receive services by telehealth uh, and sort of go over what you normally would have in writing for such a patient and ask them verbally on the visit if they consent and then document that in your chart. So I think there are ways to address that, but, but clearly, uh, uh, I do think that CMS and others understand that that uh, is not going to be, uh, that's not going to work the way it normally does, at least during this time. Another issue that's come up is how you maintain information about a telehealth visit in your electronic health record when there is no connection between the two. Uh, that's a great question. Um, my, I don't know enough about uh, the, um, the Facebook and Skype platforms to know whether those uh, visits can be recorded and if so, uh, whether information from them can be provided through other means to ultimately link into the medical records. Others here may know that and so hopefully uh, we can, if, if people do, it would be interesting to hear about that. Um, malpractice coverage for services in states where you do not hold a license. Dr. Dentman mentioned this is a problem. Um, I'm sure that is the case in a lot of states. I will say in North Carolina, I have uh, done some research and it seems that uh, the uh, malpractice insurers for North Carolina licensed physicians all have pretty much said, on, at least on their website, we understand this is an issue and we are going to cover uh, you doctors for the services that you're providing in other states, even if you're not licensed there, at least for the duration of the pandemic. Of course, the specific policies are going to differ. So unfortunately, that may not provide as much comfort uh, to someone, even in North Carolina, um, as, as it should. But I think there has been some movement on that. Another concern is uh, private insurance company payment for telehealth and really payment parity. Uh, as I indicated, in North Carolina, there, there has been that move towards parity. And in fact, before Governor Cooper ordered payment parity, Blue Cross Blue Shield came out and said it was planning on paying for telehealth visits as if they were in-service visits. Or, I'm sorry, in-person visits. Um, I understand that's not the case everywhere. And frankly, that's an issue that's going to be a lingering one as we try to figure out what happens next. What does happen after this public health emergency ends? I, I agree that reimbursement parity is going to be key. I think it's fair to say that providers will not continue to provide services via telehealth if they are not going to be paid for them. I also think it's fair to say that insurers remain skeptical that providers um, who are given a green light to provide services by telehealth will provide only services that are necessary. Um, so unfortunately, there remains some distrust <laughs> among the different healthcare stakeholders, and that's something we've just got to figure out. Something else that I think will help uh, keep some of the f these flexibilities in place after the end of the pandemic, though, are that patients, I believe, by and large, are going to like a lot of the, um, the uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, it, it, it is very consumer friendly. If patients are going to like the flexibility uh, and the convenience that they receive by being able to be in their homes and receive services by telehealth. Uh, not having to fight traffic, not having to sit in a doctor's office with other people who may be sick. And so patients, I think, are going to be asking for more uh, ways that they can see providers by telehealth and frankly, the use of these technologies, it should not be um, underestimated how that can increase patient engage engagement, help patients become more compliant with their plans of care, 
and frankly, help healthcare providers retain their patients. We're gonna to have to seriously look at, I think, um, licensure limitations. There are, you know, this is kind of funny coming from a lawyer because of course we, we also have state licensure limitations. Uh, and frankly, uh, there is concern about um, opening the flood floodgates to folks who have not been examined by the board of whatever examiners in one's state. At the same time though, uh, the way that this is playing out in this crisis demonstrates at least uh, to me that we definitely need to come up with a way to streamline uh, any multi-state licensure process if we are going to keep that state licensure process in place. And then I think the last two issues that will be interesting to see is whether CMS is going to continue to permit payment for this broader variety of services um, or and whether it's going to continue to relax the site of service requirements. Will uh, telehealth still be available and paid for for people in urban areas? What about for people in their homes or in these different types of facilities that the current flexibilities are now permitting um, services to be provided? Last but not least, um, I agree with Dr. Dintman. I don't think the HIPAA flexibility is here to stay. I think that we will go back to requiring, at least for the time being, um, so-called HIPAA compliant telehealth technologies. So my guess is that the use of, tele of um, smartphones to provide telehealth is not a long-term fix, but I do not have crystal ball, so that may change. Really fast, I wanna talk about just a couple of additional flexibilities that were included in the CARES Act interim final rule. Um, one of the really interesting things about this rule is that it was um, effective on March 31st. It was essentially released on March 30th, but it's actually applicable as of March 1st. You never see a federal rule that is retroactively active. So I think this um, is one piece of evidence that our government is looking very carefully at and, and considering very carefully uh, the importance of providing additional flexibility so that healthcare providers can get care to patients while at the same time using remote technology so that um, we can keep more people healthy while we're providing that care. So one of the things that Medicare has done is, as Dr. Dentman noted, um, changed or uh, it's addressed the facility fee for telehealth services and basically said you should be reporting the place of service code that would apply if the service was rendered in person and that and in that way CMS will pay for the service as if it was at the same rate as if it was provided in person using CPT modifier 95 whenever you're providing telehealth services. I won't go through all these, but the, these are the types of services, and there were about 80 separate CPT codes uh, that are now paid for by Medicare as telehealth services. As you can see, these run the gamut, including group psychotherapy, which I thought was an interesting one. Um, certain remote patient monitoring services, like virtual check-ins, as well as remote evaluations of patients, are now available and paid for by Medicare. Um, through telehealth to both new and established patients. Interestingly, um, again, a recognition about how important it is to keep people safe, the direct supervision that a physician or a mid-level provider is required to offer when someone with a lesser license is furnishing a service, that supervision now can be provided through an interactive telehealth methodology. And as I noted at the start, home health agencies and hospices now are permitted to provide certain services via telehealth and Medicare will pay for those. Uh, we already talked about the, op the opioid treatment centers and that they can um, provide services through audio only calls. Um, the last point I will make here is that physicians are now permitted to base their evaluation and management coding for telehealth visits on one one of two things, either the amount of time that's spent with the patient, including the time on the call and other time associated with the visit on that date. 
or they can um, base their coding on the level of complexity of their medical decision making. So those are my uh, formal comments. I will stop sharing and um, turn the, the discussion back over, I guess, to Jim or perhaps to Nick for uh, start of the q &A. So over to me. Thank you, Trish. Um, uh, and thanks to all our uh, panelists for uh, uh, the presentation. So um, in a uh, shocking development, I think this will be a first. I don't know. I haven't been to every meeting, but we did finish on time. In fact, we finished ahead of schedule. Um, record breaking opportunity to uh, get some questions in. So here's the flow. Um, I'm going to be the uh, coordinator. I might use some um, uh, Oscars music to uh, keep people brief if they go on for too long. Um, there were some questions that came up and I currently, here's the list that I have uh, going forward. So Brenda, I want to just uh, pull you in for a second because you uh, said you had some responses to some of the questions that had come up in the presentation from uh, Trish. So I'm going to call on you. David, I know you've got some uh, questions or clarifications. And then from the audience, I've got Kevin. I'll call on you in a sec. So that's the order for now. Um, uh, Brenda, if you'd like to go ahead. Sure. Oops, my fault. <laughs> Hold on. Again. We, we both did it. So you unmuted and I unmuted you at the same time. Okay. And that was a double whatever. I'll promise not to do that again. Trish missed your compliment. Uh, I said, Trish, that was an, a really great presentation to just sort of round out and really get to the details. And so impressive, thank you. And I just wanted to comment, because I heard this in another meeting, that just like we don't uh, video and we don't record in-person visits, there's no need to record or have a record of a FaceTime or whatever. What we do have to do, like we do in the standard of care, is document. So some people are having their medical assistant come in on the video and type as they do, or like I do, I scribble notes and then write the notes later. So I think that's a great clarification. Um, there was also some mention about, I think uh, Jim and I talked about that, you know, I think some distinction that'll be made is whether video conferencing is here to stay or we're gonna have to find a blend to use pictures because especially in dermatology, rheumatology, the, the blending and the compression factor of the video does not lend for good um, technology to diagnose things. So we use store and forward, and then we have a little mini video conference. But the thing that is the most uh, is striking to me is the number of physicians that are screaming and yelling, I want to go back in person. So I think that what we're going to see is 20% maybe will create a blend of their uh, I don't think we're going to have overuse because I think it's still too challenging. It takes us so much longer to do a, an in-person, you know, a, a video conference than it does an in-person. And um, we don't, people don't like it as much. So I think it'll be very interesting. I think people that continue to use it are going to find a way to take the best of it. Um, but I think we're going to see a running back to in-person uh, when that's, if that comes. I hopefully it does. Thank you, but it was really an excellent presentation. Thanks, Brenda. David, uh, uh, you had some comments and some questions, and I've also got Joyce. I will get you after Kevin. A great job moderating, Nick. Thank you. Um, Trish, just a couple of quick questions, actually starting out with one clarification. There has been some confusion at the Medicare Advantage Plan office at CMS about whether seniors need to have both audio and video uh, at the same time. Um, when conducting telemedicine visits. As I understood what you said, audio alone is enough. In other words, they can call the doctor on their cell phone or some other phone and that would be a covered visit. Is that generally correct? Well, so it's, it's not. Um, there, are, there are different kinds of visits. And so there's the telehealth visit, which is like the office visit. And my belief is that uh, you have to uh, have video with that. But there are the virtual check-ins, which are shorter visits, I think designed for the, um, the clinician to determine whether the patient needs to come in. 
uh, although the patient can't come in within uh, 24 hours. There, there are some interesting restrictions around that, but I believe that the virtual check-ins can be uh, solely by phone. And of course, the e-visits often are conducted by um, uh, through the patient portal or by email or text. So, so it, that, that would be my response, but. Yeah, it might depend on whether it's a diagnostic visit requiring diagnostic information as opposed to simply checking in and giving test results, um, having a discussion uh, about yeah. next steps, that kind of thing. Well, I, I, I think I think that's right. I think it's it depends on how the visit the visit is coded. So again, if it's a full E and M uh, medical office visit, I believe, and Dr. Dentonman can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that right now at least you have to have both uh, the yeah. the audio and the video. Well, it's an interesting uh, issue. Certainly, when you take into consideration the limitations that older people have, they they very often simply don't have the capability of doing audio and video at the same time. And when Medicare Advantage plans have gone to CMS through the usual question and answer portals, they're not get they can't get an answer to this question, and so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's out there as a big source of confusion. So maybe we can talk offline about about that. Um, For example, some resolution. Rules. I'm so sorry. I know you're not. Go supposed ahead. To the special rule uh, with the phone calls that you cannot have seen the patient seven days before or seven days after. Afterwards. Yeah. So in order for it to be like a formal uh, audio only, there are restrictions. So maybe that will change, right? So things like that. But like Trish said, right now they're looking for live synchronous, uh, you know, video consult for it to be uh, reimbursed equivalently. But we do have these other options and, uh, and the phone call can be done first on, based on time. So there are codes for that. I have a lot of that that I could share, but they're not my slides. So I would have to like, um, I would be glad to retype them and send you the information. Interesting, obviously complex. So Tricia, uh, uh, one more question and I'll stop and uh, leave time for others. On the malpractice question, would you agree that the best thing for uh, any provider who is engaging in telemedicine services across state lines, the best thing for them to do would be to be in touch with their insurance company um, and or their insurance broker and, and, and clarify that and, uh, and, and clarify it in writing. Um, since, the, since the rules seem to vary from one state to another um, and one insurance company to another. So there, 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 it looks like there is confusion, but in many cases there would be coverage. And the only way to determine that would be for a direct contact with your insurance company. I think that's right, because let's be honest, I mean, a clinician is not going to look at the Federation of State Medical Board's website first to see if it's if the person is permitted to offer telehealth services to someone in a particular state, and then um, just uh, go, go ahead and assume that they're covered there. I do think that uh, talking with malpractice insurer makes, makes the most sense, and you know, unfortunately, um, that's just, a, it, it's another step that needs to be yeah. taken to protect the doctor or the other provider. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna uh, ask Kevin to speak up. Um, I'm gonna unmute you and hopefully we can hear you. Kevin, can you uh, ask your question? I believe I can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, well, I just wanted to say thanks and Trish, I wanted to uh, just kind of point out one of your unanswered questions. I'm not 100% sure in all the cases when it's uh, feasible, but one of the companies that really spearheaded electronic document signing was DocuSign. Uh, they went through a whole bunch of hullabaloo with all kinds of states. There's actually states where you can actually sell your house and sign the documents with DocuSign. So they've just really pushed that envelope quite a bit. They have an entire white paper they did on HIPAA and DocuSign. So I think if you search for like DocuSign and HIPAA compliant, you can get it. But I'm sure at least uh, that's that's a very good avenue for doctors to look at. Um, I know in Virginia, and I think you're an attorney, so maybe David also can weigh in, but in Virginia, there's a pretty uh, well-established uh, best copy statute. So I think even an email or a form would, would, would meet the requirements as well. But anyway, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. And so just to confirm, you were talking about the issue of informed consent, I think. Yes, you, you talked okay. about getting the informed consent right. signed. 
Right. No, that's helpful. Good points. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Richard, I've got you. Uh, you're coming up next. But Joyce, um, I have your um, typed question. I'm going to unmute you now. Um, and if that works, then you can ask the question. And if it doesn't, then I'll ask it for you. Okay. Can you hear there me? We go. Yeah. Okay. Look. Oh, oh my right, God, this right. is working. This is fantastic. <laughs> Please ask so away. Much. Thank you so much for your presentations. I thought they were, it was very insightful and interesting. I kind of have two questions, but I'll ask the one. And then if you have time, uh, Nick, you can come back to me for the other one. Um, uh, the, the question is mainly for Trish. Um, so what do we do now for the snowbirds? Those are the people who live one place for a certain number of months and then go someplace else for another set of months. How do they, or do they even, do telehealth in that situation and can that model be replicated um, now that we are fully into the telehealth model? You know, that's an interesting question. It may be that Dr. Dinsman has a different or a better perspective on this than I do since yeah. I don't myself provide yeah. health care. But, you know, I will say that, um, ah, and there you are. <laughs> I think right now um, you're okay. Um, yeah. why, why don't you go ahead? Because I think, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to have a lot of uh, substantive. Uh, uh, de definitely right now you're okay. You know, because they're, they're, I mean, you literally could have them put their permanent address. I think where you get into trouble is when you have a patient and then they move. And even now, I think, because hmm. they were established, um, I think you're in good shape with the snowbirders. What, the, the disturbing thing I heard was a doctor who uh, consistently takes care of patients, let's say Arkansas, and, yeah. Yeah. Tip, tip, and the patients consistently drive over the state line to see him and his malpractice covers. And now that they're doing telehealth because he has, doesn't have a license in the adjacent state, they're not covering him. That's sort of ridiculous. Oh. They're already oh. an established patient. So that would be sort of like me constantly having patients from West Virginia, which I do, and they're covered. And then if they do telehealth, they're not covered under my malpractice. Oh. So oh, all those little details are really frustrating for the patient and for the physician. Look at him. I love it. <laughs> I love the emotion. And, um, but I think you're good with your snowbirders. I really do. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> many, le many levels. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joyce. Um, now I've got to find Richard in the list. He's, if he's lowered his hand, he's made, oh no, there we go. I'm going to, oh no, Richard, you're ready. Off you go. Yeah. yeah and you should be able to hear, hear me, right? Yes, I can. Or we can. I'm sorry. Not just me. Wonderful. Well, I, I mean, I know there was the point made a little bit earlier of, about how you get what goes on in the telehealth visit into the electronic medical record. So I, I kind of want to just expand a little bit on that. In particular, so when you do a telehealth visit complete with video, do you still have to, does the doc still have to go back into the primary medical record and record that information there as well? Or can they just put in a link to it? Because it seems like in some ways this process could really accelerate and help clinician documentation. And in the other way, uh, otherwise, it's, then it's just the same old, same old of the difficulty in doing that. You have yeah. to document. You cannot, you cannot just put a link to your, your conversation because you need to kind of go through the same uh, history, uh, review systems. They're saying you can be, of course, lax on your physical exam, although in dermatology, we still try to like visualize and put some documentation and then, you know, your treatment plan is the most important. But yeah, that it's, uh, that's why I'm saying it, it, it's not as fast as it all looks to do this. It, unless you have a real system where you have somebody scribing for you virtually, and that's taking place. I know SkyMD does that, and some of the other companies will have a virtual scribe that's listening in. Um, but no, you, you can't, I don't think you can just put a link to, you know, like a tape of what you just did. Right. And in fact, you know, that brings up the, uh, we're talking today about use of smartphones, but even, um, uh, even when you have a, uh, a 
so-called traditional telehealth uh, service that is using a different technology, say you're in the stroke unit, for example. Um, and so even, even then you have to have um, someone who is, is documenting what happens within the electronic health record or within the tele tech, the technology module that's being used for the telehealth visit. So I, I guess where I'm going with this is that at some point, maybe we will have artificial intelligence that loops this all together so that what the clinician and the patient are talking about, the important components of that are automatically fed into the medical record. That'll be pretty cool, but we're not there yet. <laughs> Okay, Excellent. thank you. Um, hey, could, I, could I make a comment on that real quick? Go ahead. Okay, so uh, Richard, yeah, this is Zircon. I think, you know, there, yes, you have to make sure that um, you still properly document the visits in the EHR, but in the selection of, the, of your platform, you know, you need to evaluate, does, does the selection you're making or of your options, do they integrate with the EHR or do they not? Because some do and some do not. So you do have that option as you're initially setting it up, is my point. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna uh, take a, a little bit of privilege and ask Marty, I have a question for you. Um, uh, you talked about all of these companies that are diving in and uh, offering um, you know, technology and everybody wants to help. And that's great. My question is, how are you teasing out the snake oil and the Dr. Oz is in this from the reality of, you know, things that are really useful? Because I, in most cases, I think people are well-intentioned, but I've seen an awful lot of um, rubbish. Let's call it that. Um, how are you sort of uh, working to sort of separate out the, uh, the good from the bad? Well, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, some of it's pretty obvious. I mean, it, it, it does happen. It, it is happening. Some of it's pretty obvious and, and, and easy to separate out. Some of it's not quite so obvious. And, and I personally feel it's better to err on, on the side of letting some of it get through and, and get to the professionals and, and, and let them tease it out versus missing something that might, that might be important. So we have a tendency uh, to, to pass things through, make the connections, make, set up the collaborations, even if it looks like it might be, uh, you know, a, a little bit unsubstantiated. And, um, uh, and then we let, let the professionals deal with it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's an anonymous question here because I don't see a name against it. So I'm just going to ask it and see who'd like to weigh in. How is Maryland preparing our business for the digital transformation? I think that's for, for you, Marty. So... <laughs> That's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, th there's there's a number of things that that are happening. Uh, we we actually are the tech council is planning a digital transformation conference uh, coming up, but I I don't believe that the date has been set. Um, you know, it's interesting. We've all been forced into a digital transformation now in in the last uh, month and a half or so. And we're seeing some companies deal well with it and other companies are, are struggling uh, heavily with the, with the transformation. Um, but um, what I found is there, there are some companies that are in the digital space that haven't made the transformation themselves and they're very interested in how other companies are doing it. So from our perspective, what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate everybody that we can. We're bringing the experts together. We're, we're putting on um, symposia and, and webinars to help facilitate the, the transfer of, of information <clears throat> for, for the digital transformation. Um, as, far, as far as the state and, and others, I mean, <clears throat> there's certainly a lot of emphasis on cybersecurity because that's a, 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 a big component of successfully making a, a, a digital transformation. Um, but I think it's, it's a matter of letting companies transition, if you will, at their own pace. Um, and then, frankly, right now, since everybody's been forced into it, support them wherever we can. I mean, the companies have had to jump into uh, telework and don't have the proper cybersecurity tools in place. And, and so we've been have, help them make connections to get their, their VPN set up and, and um, the other tools that they need to have in place in, in order to be secure. So uh, again, it's about connections and it's about education. 
Fantastic. Um, my apologies. Uh, that was a question from Joyce. I would have called on her, but um, didn't show up. Not sure why that happened, but uh, anyway. Uh, Jim, I know you had some uh, questions. Uh, let me open the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, my compliments to the speakers. This has really been interesting. I've got several questions, but let me get to the one that's kind of top of mind right now. And that is that the, the provisions to waive HIPAA restrictions during this, uh, during this emergency strikes me as a sort, the sort of thing where we could just find the road to hell paved with good intentions down the road. Uh, and I've heard uh, interesting pushback from people that have developed HIPAA compliant services and products uh, about that provision. And I'd, I'd be very interested in your thoughts. And there, I know there's some HIPAA experts uh, among the participants as well, but I'd, I'd really like to get a little bit of understanding of whether you think that's a, a benefit, uh, whether you think it's a risk, and how do you think that'll play out? So, I'll, I'll, try, I'll start or I'll try to start. Um, when you say whether we think it's a benefit or a risk, are you, are you talking about the flexibility that has been uh, agreed to or implemented for the public health emergency? Or are you asking whether the HIPAA privacy and security requirements sh uh, are a benefit for telemedicine generally? I want to make sure to no, my, my thinking and, and the, the thing, the thread I'm pulling on is that it strikes me that uh, telling somebody they can use a non-HIPAA compliant piece of technology to handle telehealth issues opens up the potential for some issues that I suspect none of us have even thought of. Uh, whether that's something being hacked, whether it's information being leaked uh, inappropriately. I mean, I, I don't know. There are people with better imaginations than, than I. And I just see some interesting risks in that situation, so. That's helpful, thank you. And I, I completely agree with you. I happen to be possibly um, in the minority in that I am a privacy advocate. And I think that um, unfortunately people do not realize how much of their information actually is already uh, released to third parties about which the individuals are completely unaware because of HIPAA and the interplay between HIPAA and state laws. So my view is that, and, and frankly, having worked with healthcare providers and others who, who have had their systems hacked and understanding, uh, I won't say how easy that is, but really that there are people who are intent on doing that and intent on selling information, whether it's medical records or financial records. Um, I think that actually having a HIPAA compliant service is extremely important because I, for one, don't want the Chinese to have all my medical information. Although, if we're honest, it does have information about all of our federal employees. Right. So my perspective is that it those protections are needed. Having said that, you know, the other thing I'll say about that is the HIPAA security rule is a scalable requirement uh, or a scalable set of regulations. And what that means is that um, what may be compliant on the security side for a small actor would not be sufficient for a larger actor. And so this, I think in turn, um, goes to show why hackers and other bad actors are looking at what they perceive to be less sophisticated entities, be they small medical practices or townships, uh, government agencies, or even hospital districts that are, um, you know, um, in, in rural areas and expecting and unfortunately finding that their, their security uh, infrastructure is not as robust as it could or should be. Uh, to protect against those sorts of threats. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging uh, situation that I think we're going to have to all work on. And, and one of the best ways I know to improve security is to train your workforce and people who have access to your systems on what they should not be doing when they're on them. 
Brenda, do you have something to add to that or you got a question? Definitely. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that from the standpoint of the physician, we feel extremely vulnerable right now. We feel that we're going to be a setup for patients complaining, for unnecessary lawsuits, for someone saying that their data got somewhere or was put on a video. And, and I really think that we have way too many HIPAA compliant devices, platforms, et cetera, uh, that we have to go back to using them. They're, and they're getting easier and easier. I know I used one recently where basically you start doing a chat and by giving your phone number and other information, it goes into, you know, they figured out and make it HIPAA compliant. That's very different than what I had to do to create my app, you know, eight years ago. But um, I, put, I think the physicians feel very vulnerable and they feel that there will be unnecessary lawsuits later. I think, I think there's a law that's being proposed uh, to our governor right now. I don't know all the details, but I think it's almost like a physician protection because people are feeling vulnerable for many reasons. Did they l not see someone in their clinic? Did they run to the ER to take care of a COVID patient and left someone else? Did they use a HIPAA non-compliant? So there's a lot of anxiety as we're having all these things, just anything goes. What's going to happen in 60 days? What's going to happen when someone says, yeah, it's not true anymore? But I think it's interesting. I saw another question in the uh, um, thread that talked about that. Well-meaning providers that get, uh, you know, fall afoul of the regulations ex posto facto. So uh, I think, you know, essential part of this. Um, I want to be sure to get to uh, Philip. Um, so Philip Stringfield, you had a question. I'm going to unmute you. Um, whilst we're getting him on. Uh, those of you that don't know, on the dark web, 500,000 uh, Zoom accounts were sold uh, for access. So uh, if you haven't secured your Zoom account, um, we have access to it. Philip. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so my name is Philip Stringfield. I'm a specialist at uh, the National Association for Community Health Centers out in Bethesda. Um, I was really wanting to know, um, since there was a lot of on the ground work in Maryland, I wanted to know if there was any uh, specific responses um, for uh, community health centers in Maryland with, as regards to either testing equipment or PPE, um, you know, just in addition to some of the incentive programs they have available as well. So just wanted to see if there was any insight that could be provided. Thank you. Philip, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to cut the tail end of your question. Could, could you go back? Um, so I work for the National Association of Community Health Centers. I was just looking to see if there was any specific responses that you were aware of um, around uh, the community health centers who are currently uh, in Maryland, just some of those that may be providing services on site um, or doing any type of testing. I just wanted to know if you had any uh, insight that you could provide. No, I'm sorry. I, I don't have anything specific to community health centers. I know, I know that there's an all-out effort for all healthcare providers to, to provide more PPE and, and to get more testing going. Um, but I, I don't know of anything specific to community health centers. Awesome. I definitely um, thought the tool you shared earlier was a definitely good insight. So um, if, if anything, I'll definitely make sure to put that plug out for them as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Philip. Leo, I'm going to unmute you. I think you've got a comment based on what I'm seeing, but let me um, put you on. Okay. Hi, thanks, Nick. Yes. A um, couple things on the HIPAA um, uh, compliance issue. One, I do want to emphasize that uh, HIPAA compliance and uh, security uh, are connected, but they don't map one to one. So that's a very important thing to consider just because something is HIPAA compliant doesn't mean it's necessarily secure, especially uh, from opportunistic attacks of the kind that are going on now. But what I wanted to point out is that there's an interesting uh, effort that was made to address a, a similar problem in the cybersecurity world in the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act of 2015, which stated that if you are sharing uh, cyber threat information and indicators of compromise uh, with appropriate uh, entities, there's a list of, of who's appropriate, that information cannot be used for regulatory purposes uh, to, to find you. And so OCR cannot fine a hospital if it admits that it has uh, this, that, or the other problem. The hospital is not relieved from the obligation to report a breach or an attempted breach or things like that. But the, the law tried to say, we're going to give, and they didn't use the concept safe harbor. The industry is still pushing very hard for some sort of a safe harbor approach to this. And uh, that, that's been a difficult 
uh, thing to get done. The, the, the CISA Act didn't fully succeed uh, in, in creating the open sharing of information that was anticipated, but I think it, it points in the right direction, that there's got to be a way to um, relieve the, the regulatory and fining uh, uh, part of the compliance um, when it's necessary to, to create a space uh, where people need to communicate and or uh, utilize capabilities that, that, that don't meet you know, the, the pre the, or the standard compliance mode. So that, that's just a, it's a lesson learned from the cybersecurity side of the house that I think sooner or later is, is gonna have to be thought about from other parts of the compliance uh, world. Thanks, Leo. That's uh, very helpful. And I see it in the chat for those folks. Um, I think you sent it just to the panelists, but um, that CISA 2015 is uh, a helpful reference. So uh, appreciate that. Um, I, I know there were some other questions, but uh, I don't want to hold people up unnecessary. There's nothing else from the audience at this point. Um, we're uh, about 10 minutes away from uh, the end of this session, and I certainly don't want to hold people unnecessarily in the uh, matrix, which is where we all are, of course. Um, uh, any additional thoughts from the um, uh, panelists? Uh, if I may, I have another question for Marty, actually, and that's that I'm that's something I haven't heard a lot about, and I, I my sense is that you are fairly well connected to the startup community in Maryland, and I'm just wondering what what the carnage has been with startups uh, in this environment. I mean, they've, they've, a lot of them have just seen the floor knocked out from under them and their business model has been trashed. And uh, it may be too early to see what the fallout's gonna be, but what, what is your sense so far? So, so it, it is too early to understand um, exactly what the fallout's going to be. And, and we're seeing a, a lot of different reactions. Some of the very early stage startups that fortunately they're so early stage that they've been able to just stop and pause and, and they'll start up again once we get through this, this event. Um, others that are a little bit further along, uh, uh, the ones, the ones in, in my world in tech and life sciences that got hit the hardest in the beginning were the ones that were in need of capital and were just about to raise money um, because that, that put them on the edge of a cliff that, that they're having great uh, difficulty recovering from. Um, there's, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's, a, there's another handful that have enough capital right now, but they see their pipelines drying up. And, and so they're anticipating big problems coming a, a month from now, 60 days from now, um, because, because their pipelines are drying up. So, so uh, there are different reasons that different companies are, are in trouble. Um, most companies, frankly, are in some form of trouble right now be because of all of this. Um, but num a number of the very early stage startups, uh, frankly, I, I believe the ones that I've talked to have been able to put things on pause and, and they'll start up again. It's the, it's the ones that are a bit further along that are in a, that very delicate stage um, of an early stage startup that, um, that unfortunately we're gonna see a, a lot of carnage in that group, I'm afraid. Marty, could I ask you a question uh, while you have mm -hmm. the floor? Could you repeat or, or, or tell us how to get access to the wizard tool that you referenced in your presentation? Sure, um, the, 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 the direct website is reliefwizard.net. Um, you can also go, to, there's, there's Actually, there's many websites that have picked it up and linked to it now, but you can also go to the Maryland Tech Council website, which is mdtechcouncil.com and find it on the homepage there. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we are done. So um, I guess uh, that's also a, another record. We're finishing early. But that's okay. always a good thing on uh, a Friday and the fact that nobody has terribly far to go. So, um, well, I well, Nick, first of all, Nick, thank you very much. I, I want to go back to one thing that Trish showed on her slide that perhaps we could, I love the notion of allowing telemedicine to be used for group psychotherapy. So I'd like that's to, what encourage this us, is. I, I would encourage us all to consider a group happy hour this afternoon. Uh, and, and call that psychotherapy and see if we can get reimbursed for it. So that's, that's my recommendation. 
as as well, you know, that's my background too for this. <laughs> oh, the, the the whiskey yes. dimension right. of that never Burnett. ending whiskey. I'll be clear, but um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks thank you everybody, for, yeah. and thank you, Jim. And um, we will uh, see you at least again on um, May fifteenth uh, for for our next call, our next meeting. All right. And once again, thanks to uh, the, the to Trish, to Dr. Deniman, and to Marty uh, for really interesting presentations and for sharing your time with us. And Nick, thank you for orchestrating all this. So thank you. This was great. Let right. me safe, everyone. Take oh, care, everybody.